you guys for joining us. Uh, I'm Candace Shively with Utah State University Extension, and these monthly webinars are supported by USU Center for Water Efficient Landscaping. This is our first webinar of the new year, and I'm really excited to have Laura Allen. Uh, she's the founding member of Gray Water Action joining us today. Um, Laura has spent the past 15 years exploring low-tech, urban, sustainable water solutions. She's the lead author of the San Francisco Gray Water Design Guidelines for Outdoor Irrigation, and she's also authored the Waterwise Home, How to Conserve and Reuse Water in Your Home Landscape, as well as Gray Water, Green Landscape. Uh, she has a bachelor's degree in environmental science. She has teaching credentials and a master's in education. She has led many classes and workshops on rainwater harvesting, gray water reuse, and composting toilets, and we are really excited to have her joining us today. Uh, today she's going to talk about their latest online learning opportunity, which is titled Alternative Water Sources, and it's being offered through Northwest Water and Energy Education Institutes uh, at Lane, Lane Community College. Um, so, with that, I'm really excited that she agreed to join us today, and I will turn the time over to Laura. So, my name is Laura Allen, and I'm going to talk about alternate water sources, which are pretty much everything except what comes out of the tap. That's our potable water supply, and it's really important that we have that for our human drinking needs and um, many other cooking and all that. But there's a lot of ways we use water that we don't actually need it to be potable and we have alternate sources. Um, just a bit about me and my organization, Gray Water Action. Gray Water Action is a nonprofit and we teach people how to reuse water. We focus on the simple, affordable, low-tech options um, that are more accessible to more people. And we also educate about kind of all the options because there's, there's a range and there's many tools and many different ways to do things. So we want people to know their options and guide them to choosing what will be the best in their situation. We do a lot of hands-on classes. We like to show people really how this works um, and build, build simple gray water systems. We also train professionals. That picture on the top is a, a group who just finished our five-day gray water installers training who are wanting to take that out and use it as part of their businesses. Um, so the books Candace already mentioned, these are um, how-to books. So they're really designed to help a person figure out how to design and install these simple gray water systems, as well as understand if a simple system will be the right choice for them. Um, and our, I'm gonna share our website at the end, but just to make sure um, that I don't forget, our website, graywateraction.org, has a lot of resources, and there's webinars, recorded free webinars, there's manuals, um, just a whole bunch of resources in uh, English, Spanish, and um, Chinese. We have some downloadable um, documents. I want to talk about a program that it's a class. It's a 10 week class as part of a water conservation technician program. We actually just found out that people have to pay out of state tuition unless they're in a state that touches Oregon. So that was kind of a disappointment, but um, it is available. It's a great class. It just started last week. So if any of you are interested, you can contact Brenda Cervantes. Her email's at the bottom of that screen, and she's the person that would help with registration. It's through Lane Community College, and it's a for credit class and it'll talk about alternate water sources extensively um, over 10 weeks. And you can also get in touch with me. My email is going to be at the last slide if you want to know more. I'm teaching it, but we are not hosting it, so we're, we don't have control over um, the in-state versus out-of-state tuition that we just discovered about last week. So we're going to start talking about um, gray water and different water sources. And we really don't need to be using this potable supply for everything, like a plant. They, they don't need clean drinking water. They can be perfectly happy with other sources, but there's definitely things to know. Um, and we'll start with rainwater versus stormwater. And just so you guys know, there's a little pop-up box like right in the middle of my screen that I can't move. And so I'm, I can't see everything. So hopefully that won't be a problem, but if I pause, that is why. Um, so just to clarify, the difference between rainwater and stormwater, rainwater is what lands on our roofs and we can divert it and use it right away before it touches the ground. Once it hits the ground, flowing over driveways or streets, it becomes stormwater. And it can also be reused, but it's a little different because it's, uh, we have less control over the contamination than it might have picked up versus on our roofs, we have a lot of 
uh, ability to keep out most of the stuff that could get the water contaminated. So starting with rainwater, it's an excellent supply and you get quite a lot of it, um, but it's not always there when you need it. So in the West, we mostly get all of our rain during the rainy season and our plants don't need irrigation. Um, and then in the winter, when it rains more, we don't really need to be irrigating. Though, of course, that varies and there's droughts and you know there's lots of times when we get some rain and then not for a long time. And so we can collect that water and, and reuse it. Um, but that, that's kind of the biggest challenge with rainwater in certain states. Some states get their rain consistently throughout the year and then that's not a challenge. But if you're in a Mediterranean climate, you're gonna be working with that um, logistical challenge of there could be lots of it, even one inch of rain can you know, be hundred, hundreds of gallons of water that um, you can put to good use. So there's a couple of ways to use rainwater. One is just to catch and release it. So when rainwater, flushes across our cities, it can become a, a pretty large problem if we're not managing it in a thoughtful way. Um, currently, we've designed cities to really just get rid of the water. It flushes, it washes our roofs, our streets, you know, it picks up lots of pollution and it gets out into the environment. Um, so one thing we can do is just catch it and then slowly release it over time. We're just preventing those flashes of lots of water that aren't very good for our waterways when it gets into them or our streets and you know, causing flooding. So we can catch the rainwater in like a rain barrel and then have a hose and just let it drain out and slowly be released into the landscape. That's a great way to use it. We also can design what's called rain gardens, and I'll talk more about that in a minute, um, places where we intentionally modified our landscape to, to be able to pool up and hold that rainwater and then slowly sink it down. So we can deeply charge the soils, uh, our plants, as well as prevent it from running off. And then we can also catch it, collect it, and then use that water. So a tank, a rain barrel, lots of rain barrels connected together, um, but storing that water up for a later use. So here's a couple of different pictures. There's, you can have one rain barrel. That's a great start. Um, you can see it's a great educational tool to just have one single rain barrel because you can see how, how much 50 gallons or 55 gallons, how far that goes, how quickly it fills up and how quickly it's used. And that can be a great awareness builder for people because we don't often know like how many gallons our landscapes drink up unless we measure it out in a rain barrel, for example. Um, we can collect a lot, connect a lot of rain barrels together. You can see in the lower picture, there's eight rain barrels connected together under a, um, a deck. And you can find these many, many um, landscapes and homes have these little like dead spaces that aren't really being utilized. And that can be a great place to hide some rainwater storage away. Um, we can also have a tank, like a 3,000 gallon tank near a home. It's quite large, so it depends on the size of your property, whether 3,000 gallons would feel like a humongous um, big thing that's taking up a lot of space, or you wouldn't even really notice it, depending on the size of your property. And then some homes have a huge tank, like 10,000 gallons. It can be located away. Rainwater, as long as the inlet of the tank is lower than where you're coming off the gutters, the water can travel under in a buried pipe and then back up into your rain barrel. So it doesn't have to be right next to your home. Um, and then you can have a quite large tank that would be a supply a lot of water. There's a couple of pictures. This is on Alcatraz Island in San Francisco where, you know, San Francisco is, um, they don't get a ton of rain, but they do, um, they do get rain and it's a pretty mild climate, but Alcatraz Island doesn't have a lot of, of fresh water and their plants do, they have some irrigation there. But plants need irrigation, so they put in a rainwater system to collect water and use that on this island. Um, here's another picture from San Francisco of an indoor rainwater system. When rainwater is being used all inside the building, it can be used for toilet flushing rather simply. Um, it can also be used for all water needs, but then the treatment required is going to be a little more um, extensive because people would be having more contact with it. But for toilet flushing, it doesn't need a whole lot of treatment typically and a great benefit with that is you can be using it all during th throughout the rainy season so if it's raining and then it's not raining you can still be your tank fills up rather quickly and then you can use that and it fills up again um, but of course it all depends on the the climate and the intention and um, what people want out of the rainwater system there can be underground storage there's some examples of very, very large rainwater collection. This is a 20,000 gallon of storage underneath that parking lot. Um, and then there's potable systems too. This one is on 
Lopez Island in Washington state. There are certain states in the US that rainwater use for all household needs, including drinking water is quite common, including this islands uh, in Washington state. Um, Texas has a lot of potable rainwater systems and Hawaii has a whole bunch of potable rainwater systems. There are many states that don't allow that. Um, there's many states that you know, have a variety of restrictions on rainwater use, but mostly pretty much everywhere you can use rainwater for irrigation. Um, but to use it indoors, then the, the permitting and regulations can get a bit more uh, involved because now you're having a potentially non-potable supply of water coming into the home. Um, and that takes thoughtful design and some regulation to make sure people do it safely. So I'm gonna leave rainwater for a second, go to stormwater. So now the water, so back to the rainwater, excuse me, go back. So with proper um, screens and keeping debris out and there's first flush diverters, ways you can wash off the dirtiest rain. With that, the water coming into the tank is relatively clean. And then you can have filters and disinfection if it's gonna be used for drinking. But once the water hits the ground, it's picked up a lot more contamination um, and that water is gonna be used differently though it's definitely a great resource and can be directed or and reused. A rain garden is a really common way to use it. And this is just a part of the landscape that you have cited to be far enough away from buildings and not too close to a steep slope where you can put a lot of water during rain events. And it's a depressed area, so like a basin. And you've managed where the overflow is gonna be because when it's raining, there's gonna be a lot of water. And if there's extra water, it has to go somewhere. And then you plant it with plants that can be, they can be really wet during the rainy time and then they can also dry out completely and survive just fine. So they're gonna be your natives or from a climate really similar to where you are. And they'll probably be like a riparian plant. There's many options and there's great resources all over for rain gardens. So you can have them look um, many different ways depending on whether they're in the sun or in the shade mm -hmm. and where you live and uh, what likes to grow in your area. And so basically you are preventing stormwater pollution. You're keeping that water on your site. You also have a place where you're growing natives, which are great habitat. And you have a section of your landscape that doesn't need any irrigation. You do need to establish your plants, like irrigate them at first to get the, them established. But after that, rain garden should thrive with no irrigation. So you've prevented a problem, the stormwater pollution, and you're having this no water landscape that's creating um, a nice habitat for the native pollinators. Um, so here's a kind of, of schematics you can see when the water's going in. It's a, the planted area, the rain garden is lower down, so it can pool up and then a lot of infiltration can happen in that area. And that is cleaning the stormwater and preventing flooding downstream. Um, and this slide just shows kind of the differences. Sometimes people think they're really concerned about the environment and they're wanting to manage their stormwater properly, um, or maybe they just want to grow natives. And so a rain garden would be great for that. Sometimes people want to use rainwater for vegetables or um, store it up for later use, and then you would need a tank. But rain gardens really can you'd be used for many to meet many people's goals. So just want to make sure that people understand the difference between a tank and a rain garden um, and why you would do one versus the other. And you can combine them too. You can have a tank that overflows into a rain garden and you can have one gutter connected to a, a rain barrel and another gutter going into a rain garden. So they can definitely work really well together on your landscape. I'll just end with the stormwater portion to bring up, there can be much larger scale examples of this at the commercial scale. Um, these really large systems, um, they collect stormwater, they treat it, and they reuse it. So the water can be reused for toilet flushing or irrigation, but it does require pretty extensive treatment and it's going to be pumped and filtered and moved around the landscape. So it's definitely possible, but it's not really a residential scale type of system. Um, so now we're gonna move into gray water. So gray water, when you think about it, we use a lot of water in the home, like our washing machine, and that water, we know exactly what went into it, and then normally it goes off to our sewer plant or our septic system, and it's really not reused in most situations. Um, we can really simply be reusing that water in our own landscapes, and there's a few things to know. I'm gonna touch on them and then encourage you to 
learn more if you think this might be a good solution for you. With gray water, you want to be replacing irrigation. And if you're replacing something, like let's say you had some fruit trees that you used to water with a hose or with a drip irrigation system, if you're replacing that irrigation with gray water irrigation, you can expect to see between 16 to 40 percent reduction in your water consumption. And that's a pretty large range. And the reason for that range is many homes that are already built, you can't access all of your sources of gray water. You might find out that your home is on a slab on, slab on grade foundation and the shower pipes are buried in concrete and it would be a humongous project to get that gray water separated out before it combines with your toilet water. Um, you might find that your home has a nice big crawl space. You can go underneath there and access all your pipes for your showers, your sinks, your washing machine. So it really depends on the situation and also your landscape, um, whether you can get to the plants that you're irrigating. In this picture, you can see this home has many different gray water systems. And this is really common in a retrofit that you will look at your, all your fixtures and you'll look at your yard and you'll see, well, which, what fixture can water which portion of my yard? And you might have several different systems that all work together to irrigate your landscape. It's not very common in a retrofit situation to bring all the gray water together and then send it all back out to your landscape. That would be quite costly and you would end up having a more, um, expensive and difficult to maintain system than if you had kept your sources separate. And I really like to encourage people to think about the irrigation and the water savings before they design a gray water system. Um, so the question is, do gray water systems save water? And in kind of logically, we should think, of course they do. If you're watering with the hose and now you're not because you're watering with gray water, you're going to save water. And that is true if you design it properly, but you'll find kind of if you go out there in the gray water world that many people don't design them properly. They just think, oh, I put it in a gray water system. I'm going to save water. And that's totally not true. Um, the graph on the left is a study that we did in central California of a bunch of people's gray water systems. We looked at their water bills and over time before they put in their system and after. And we saw that, yes, these people were saving water. The red line is what they used before gray water. The black line is after. You can see there's a, a big drop. Um, and these were people who had gone to classes for the most part, who had done some education, who'd really learned about gray water, and then they did it because they wanted to save water. The picture on the right is a home that was part of a program where someone installed a free gray water system for them. And they didn't really understand the concept of saving water with gray water. And you can see this nice green lawn. This is Southern California where you would never see a green lawn unless you're irrigating it because it doesn't rain very much. And they planted brand new fruit trees. They put them right in the middle of that lawn. And then they sent the washing machine water to them. And you know, just by looking at this picture, I could say, it's pretty much not possible for this home to save any water because you can see that lawn is still nice and bright green. So they're, they were watering the lawn before they put in the fruit trees. They put in new trees plus gray water and they're still watering their lawn. So now those they're kind of double irrigating that area. It's probably not hurting anything, but it's definitely not saving water. So you want to take some time to pause and think about, well, you know, this is my yard and I want to save water with gray water. What could I do? In this particular instance, I would say, oh, you could move your trees to a section of your yard and you could re remove that lawn, shut off some sprinkler heads, put down some kind of other, like a wood chip um, landscape that doesn't require irrigation and then irrigate those fruit trees with your washing machine. So you'd have new trees, you'd be saving water, and you'd have a slightly smaller lawn. That would be one option. So just to kind of back up and what is gray water? It's water from your sinks, showers, and your washing machines. Um, kitchen water, it depends on what state you live in, whether kitchen water is considered gray water, like these other sources, or black water, like the toilet. Some states actually call it dark gray water, which I think is probably the best term for it, and it really clarifies that it's a little bit different. Kitchen water is greasier, it's gunkier, it has food scraps in it, um, but it's clearly not the same as what goes down the toilet. So you do wanna be aware that kitchen water um, is in, in Utah, it's actually not considered gray water, as well as in California, where I do a lot of my work. In Oregon, where I now live, it is considered gray water. And that's something that I personally would like to change and get it to be consistently called dark gray water, which it can be reused, but it, is, it has special considerations. So 
one thing, all gray water sources, whatever you put down the drain, it goes into the gray water. So we have a lot of control when it's in our own home. We can control what soaps we buy. Um, we, we can't control that there's gonna be dirt and gunk and stuff going down the drain that's gonna be in all gray water, but we can control and monitor what other products we put into that water. It's never from the toilet. That though toilet water can be reused, not at, but it should not be reused and it's not legal to reuse it at the residential scale, like in your own home. That's when you get to, there could be much more chance of um, contamination from diseases and we want to make sure that that water is treated properly and that people don't have any contact with it. So gray water is not from your toilet. And then is it legal? Legality of gray water varies state by state. Um, what agency regulates it varies greatly across the country. So currently in Utah, there is a code for gray water, but it's very prohibitive. So I would say that basically it's not legal. It's not that it says gray water is illegal, but the requirements to comply with the existing code pretty much make it so no one can install a system. Um, I've been following just online, there has been some movement. This is a news article that maybe you've seen. Um, there's a professor who has been part of a, um, like a, they've been, she put, was able to put in a simple system and they're monitoring it to see if they feel like it's safe and if it might, which is with the intention of changing the code. So I would say that hopefully in the nearest future, the regulations will change. Um, and a great way to help change regulations is to express interest in wanting to do legal systems and pointing to other states that have regulations that have been in place and seeing their successes, um, which there's a bunch of states. California has a pretty decent code. Arizona and New Mexico have great codes that address health and safety concerns and make sure that systems comply with that, but then they don't create a lot of cost or um, oversight, which it makes it pretty onerous for people who are trying to save water to have a, a lot of cost re requested of them or required of them just to save water. So there's, there's a handful of good examples in other states and hopefully well, it seems like any state that's considering code change is always making their code more friendly to allow people to legally reuse it. Um, so when you use gray water, you want to use what's called plant-friendly products. These are products that don't contain boron. Boron is a plant microtoxin and it can harm them over time. It builds up in the soil and high levels of salt. Um, so you think about like a powdered detergent, laundry detergent, all that powder is like salt. So it's very salty and that would not be a suitable irrigation quality water over time. One time someone uses the quote unquote wrong product, it's really not going to do anything. Um, but over time you could be having salt build up or boron build up in the soil and harming plants. Luckily, it's really easy to find the good products. Um, Ecos is available at Costco, um, Trader Joe's has a brand that's suitable, pretty much any major grocery store, definitely any like health food store or alternative natural grocery store will have something. Um, so you don't have to like mail order it, but you do have to be aware of what, what you should be looking for and check out the ingredients. Um, and then another thing, you can't use sodium based water softeners. So if people have water softeners that are sodium based, they will either need to switch out their softener or use a different, they could use a potassium based salt instead of sodium um, or do something else. So that's something that can be a limiting factor for in some areas. And again, gray water is not potable and it sounds really obvious, but people aren't used to irrigating with something that's not potable. We're used to, you know, any garden hose or pretty much any thing you irrigate with in an average situation is going to be drinking water that's coming out. And so if it's sprayed in the air, <clears throat> it's not really a big deal. But when you have a non-potable source of water that could have germs in it, you don't want that being sprayed in the air. Um, you don't want people to have direct contact with it. And also gray water has nutrients in it, which for our garden is just like little bits of fertilizer. It's totally not a problem. But if the gray water were to get out of our gardens or our landscapes and get into the storm drains or be too close to a creek, those nutrients become a source of pollution because they cause algae to grow and that's nutrient pollution of waterways. So you have to make sure gray water doesn't get into a storm drain system. It's, you're not too close to a creek. Um, you don't have a way for people to access it unless they're intentionally doing maintenance on your system. And you don't irrigate the part of a food that someone would eat. Um, so what that means is you don't want gray water to touch the part of the food you eat, like a carrot or an onion. Um, 
a fruit tree is great because the gray water is going down into the soil, into the roots, and the food is above the ground. So there's lots of things you can grow that are edible, like fruit trees. And there's also many plants that need irrigation that you don't eat at all. So non-edibles, your ornamentals that you've chosen to have an ecological benefit in your landscape. Those are great options for gray water irrigation. We always use mulch, and so I'm sure you've seen this in landscaping. It's used to uh, prevent evaporation, to you know, create organic matter. It's a great landscape um, tool or material. We also use it in gray water to filter the gray water. So all that little gunky stuff and lint and hair and debris in the water will clog the soil if you're putting gray water onto the soil, but if you send it through a wood chip filter first, it doesn't clog the soil because all that stuff gets stuck in the wood chips. Microorganisms will break it down and the gray water will soak into the soil. Um, that's a maintenance point that once a year or so you'll need to go and kind of clean out your mulch filter and what you are cleaning out is now nice organic matter that you've created in your landscape. So it's a, another benefit to the landscape. We create what's called a mulch basin. So it's just a shallow basin that you've removed soil filled with wood chips. That way the gray water can soak down without running off. It's a space to contain it and it gives it capacity. So you can put a bunch of water in one spot. It'll spread out around the bottom of that basin and irrigate a larger root zone of the plant. And again, we want we want a way for to redirect the gray water for maintenance or if it's really wet, if there's a rainy time where your soil is saturated, you don't want the gray water to go out. So you always use what's called a diverter valve so you can redirect the gray water back to the sewer or septic. So ways to use gray water, um, the first way is irrigation. There's simple irrigation. You're basically directly sending the gray water out into your landscape. You use a wood chip filter. It's very simple. You can often use gravity. Um, sometimes you need a pump, but not always. And you're irrigating appropriate plants. Um, you can also filter it. You can pump and filter gray water. That requires more maintenance and is more prone to system failure because it has more components and more things to break, but it definitely can work. You just have to be ready to maintain your filter. Um, and then the second way is treating gray water for non-potable uses like toilet flushing. And really um, this is suitable for larger scale situations because these indoor reuse systems require more maintenance than is you know, reasonable to expect a person to do and as well as they're quite costly. So if you have any irrigation need at all, I would definitely recommend people steer them to the irrigation first. And then if you have nothing to irrigate and you want to flush toilets, you can more easily flush toilets with rainwater if you have that resource. And if you don't, then you could consider gray water for toilet flushing. These simple gray water systems, I'm gonna show you a couple examples. They are great for your larger plants, your trees, your bushes, your vines, uh, your larger annuals and perennials. And the reason they're good for the larger plants is because with a simple system, you can't spread out the water to very many places. And so you wanna hit plants that need more irrigation, like a one tree needs more water versus like a um, hundred, some really tiny plant, which might need a comparable amount of water. So it's just a logistical consideration. It's not a water quality consideration. So these simple systems are not suitable for lawns or a lot of little plants. You can irrigate these things with gray water, but it requires a much more complex, which you should read as costly, type of system. So it's really not used for most residential type gray water systems. So here's a simple one um, called the laundry to landscape. This one in, many, in California, for example, it doesn't require a permit at all, uh, as well as there's a handful of states, because you don't actually have to change your plumbing. You're just connecting your diverter valve directly to the discharge hose of your washing machine. Um, so it's a very easy to install system and it doesn't change your plumbing at all. It doesn't really change anything about the home, except you do have to get that pipe then outside. So there's going to be a small hole drilled through the wall or through the floor. Somehow you get out to the landscape. And the washing machine actually pumps the water out to your plants. It's the, the system is kind of this odd um, adaptation of using your appliance, which is your washing machine, to pump your water out into your landscape. So there's um, some uh, requirements that you need to follow so you don't overtax your washing machine pump. But if you follow them, the system works really well and it's great for irrigating a portion of your landscape. Here's a couple pictures. There's the diverter valve in the home. Um, in the left picture, it's going through the crawl space. 
in the right side, it's going out through the wall. And then when you're outside, you see tubing. This is a one inch tubing. So it's a little bit bigger than typical um, drip irrigation. And the outlets are actually just open ends. They're not, there's not, no emitters, there's no small holes to try to push um, gunky gray water through. These are full open outlets, so half inch. And the open end is actually one inch. So you are letting all that lint and debris actually flow out through your system and then be filtered once it reaches the landscape in the mulch basin. And this system, as you can see, is not finished. So the tubing will be buried. That mulch basin that's running along the front of these row of trees will be all filled in and you'll put the, those caps back on top of those valve boxes. If you guys are probably familiar with valve boxes, the bottom is totally open. So the water just flows in and then flows down and there's nothing at the bottom. So that's where it then hits the wood chips and filters through the wood chips and soaks through that basin. So when it's done, you just see the tops of those green valve boxes like that, and there's a lot of mulch. The picture on the left is a row of fruit trees. The picture on the right is a bunch of different perennial plants, and the irrigation points are kind of spread out through the middle of that. So those are two examples of really suitable landscapes for a simple gray water system to irrigate. So the next kind is a gravity flow system. It's called a branch drain. And these two systems were invented by a man named Art Ludwig of Oasis Design, who has um, done a lot of education around gray water as well. Um, this one only works if your landscape's lower than your home. But if you have that situation and you have these suitable type plants, it's a great system. There's no moving parts, nothing to break. You put in a diverter valve. This is now under your fixture, like your bathtub and one side of the valve goes out to your landscape. The pipe's flowing by gravity out and you divert it using a special fitting called a flow splitter. So you're dividing up the flow of water to half quarter eighths and you've calculated how much water is being produced in the shower versus how much water does your landscape want. So you've appropriately divided up the flow and when you've done it, now the water's flowing out and irrigating your landscape. So it's a really uh, low, maintenance system and very little goes wrong with this. So it's a lot of work to install it. But sometimes you don't have gravity options. You might have a hill, an upward sloping hill, or you might have a big patio or something to cross over before you get to your plants and you can't install a gravity flow system. So you have to pump your gray water. And you can, for sure. Um, these are two pictures of pumps. The one on the left is in the basement. The one on the right is in a crawl space. So it's a, depending on your setup, it can be a, a bit challenging to get that drum. Um, that sh it's a, like a temporary surge tank. Um, get it in there and there'll be a pump inside. It's an effluent pump designed for dirty water. So it can pump out the dirty gray water without clogging. And it goes out into an irrigation system pretty much identical to the laundry to landscape that I showed you a couple of slides previously. So the tubing's bigger than regular irrigation, the outlets are large to let all the kind of gunky stuff in the gray water come out. So this is a simple pump system. There's no filters, there's no controllers, no timers. It's totally separate from any other irrigation system. Gray water comes in, once it reaches the top, there's a little float, then the float engages and then the pump pumps out everything into the system you've set up. And then kind of the last of the residential systems are gonna be systems that have filters. And there are some systems that have, a, a there's a little tank, a pump, gray water goes out to a filter and a person's supposed to manually clean out the filter. And those really don't have a very good, um, what's the word? They have a lot of, they're prone to failure and abandonment because it's really, people get tired of cleaning out the filter. It's not like super hard, but it definitely is not a fun task. So if you install a system that requires you every three months to clean out your filter, most likely you're going to forget or you're going to get tired of it. So there are systems that have reduced that maintenance to about once a year by having the filters have a way to be automatically cleaned or having enough large enough capacity that you don't have to do anything more than once a year. So here are two examples of those. Um, the one on the left is cleaned by compressed air, kind of pushes the air up through the filter on a cycle and then the next flow of gray water will just wash out all the debris and so that really keeps that filter going for a lot longer and the one on the right the filter actually twists and turns itself backwards once in a while and gets cleaned out that way so there are options for self-cleaning filters the cost of course is going to be higher 
um, but it is, a, it is an option. And once you've done this, then you can go into a drip irrigation system, which I'm sure you're familiar with. So you have um, less restrictions on what you can irrigate and how you design the irrigation, but you still are going to be using specialized irrigation equipment because even filtered gray water is dirtier than tap water. And so you have to have um, drip irrigation that's designed for a more a, a dirtier water. Otherwise, you'll get clogging. And there are these very high-end systems that are going into new construction. They're typically installed in a home that's le seeking LEED certification. They're really putting a lot of investment into the home and the, the homeowners have a lot of financial resources. So their systems, um, and actually really, I didn't really tell you any prices on these, but backing up a little bit, laundry to landscape, you're spending maybe $200 in materials. And then if you hire someone, it's like a day of work. So the price range is, between like 800 to 2000, depending on how big of a job it is. The next one, that gravity flow system was maybe $300 in materials and then two or three days of labor. So the price goes up a little bit, it's more labor. Pump systems, double that, um, though the labor is less. So you can see you're in the maybe a couple thousand dollars if you're hiring somebody, a couple hundred if you're doing it yourself. Um, now we get into these systems and this is maybe 10,000, 15,000, possibly $20,000. So the cost really is just a whole different scale of cost. And so that really limits who's gonna put in this kind of system. Um, but it is, it functions very similar to a, a regular irrigation system. The filter is automatically cleaned. Um, if it runs out of gray water, it can pull in other sources like a rainwater supply or a tap water supply. And it can monitor the system, how much water you're using. Uh, can, you can check it on your smartphone. It really just is a very sophisticated system. So these are going into residential, though, again, it's very limited um, type of person that's gonna put this in. And they can go into commercial and larger scale systems where there really is just a lot of water and a landscape that they would like to have a more um, kind of automated irrigation situation. Um, and so I'm going to just talk about one, actually two more types of water that are less common at the residential scale, but just so you have kind of the awareness of all of the different options. So we also have black water, toilet water, and cities and places are looking at this as a great source of water. So if you have water shortages, you go to any street and there are these pipes with full of water flowing down them. And it's really, we call it wastewater, but is it, it's only waste if we don't use it for wasting it. So there's something called sewer mining, which is accessing, tapping into the sewer pipes and taking that water out and treating it. So like a little mini treatment plant and then using that on site. So this is a picture in the city of Anaheim. This is in Southern California. They are doing it as a demonstration of like, look, we can just take out this dirty water, clean it up, and now we can use it for irrigation and toilet flushing. And these are pretty, they, they're becoming more, more common because you can, there's always sewer water if you're in any type of urban environment or anywhere there's people, there's going to be, well, I shouldn't say anywhere, usually there's anywhere there's people and tap water coming in, there's going to be black water going out. And so that can be tapped into and reused um, on a smaller footprint than a whole treatment plant. But it's pretty much the same thing. It's like a little, little treatment plant to get it to a quality that's non-potable, but it's reusable. Here's a, another example, this is in Australia, and you can see some of the technology in that picture on the lower left. It's um, in the basement, they're treating all that water. This is Aquacell, is a company that makes, or it's a, a product that treats the, in the, the black water. It can also be used for gray water. It's pretty much the same when you get to this large of a scale. And here's another example. Um, this is the San Francisco Public Utilities Commission. This is downtown San Francisco. They treat all of their black water right on site. They have a living machine, so they treat it through some kind of kind of standard wastewater treatment as well as plants. So they have these plant cells that do the finishing treatment of the water and they use that for toilet flushing. Um, they're reducing their potable consumption by 65%. Um, and they're finding they actually have more more water than they necessarily need for non-potable needs. So that San Francisco is looking into sharing this treated wastewater between the buildings when they're in this very urban environment. And then you can also treat septic water. So getting to the more um, rural and, or even just where people have septic systems, there are ways to treat it. Whether it's, whether it's allowed or not, that really varies state by state, but some states it's an accepted technology to use 
these uh, treatment systems that basically are right after your septic tank. They're going to treat the water a little more and then use it for subsurface irrigation. Aranco is a company that makes a lot of these treatment systems that are used. Um, they can be used at residential scale as well as a larger scale um, that's using an on-site wastewater system. And lastly, there's mechanical water and foundation drainage water. These are often called nuisance waters. So their mechanical water is like the, the condensates. Have you ever seen like air conditioning units on the outside of a, you know, in people's windows, they're just dripping water down the side of them. And sometimes people will connect a little tube and put that into a little barrel and use that water. In a bigger building, it's actually a, a lot of water. So those, they can create a whole system to reuse that water, that condensate water. Um, and then the other kind is the foundation drainage water. In some places, when you dig down into the ground for these large buildings, there's, there's water down there, even in dry climates, um, but it's very site specific. And that water can be used for something. Um, the common practice is just to pump it out into the sewer system or get rid of it. It's called a nuisance water, but it can actually be reused. So we'll look at two examples. Uh, this is a cooling tower system. They're using the condensate and, and reusing that water in their, in their other mechanical systems and they're reducing 15,000 gallons per day. So these, in some climates, there can be a lot of this condensate water. In hot, moist climates, that's where you get the most of it, but there is gonna be some amount of condensate anytime you have an air conditioning unit. And here's a nuisance water. Um, Los Angeles actually has a lot of that, which is a very dry, hot place typically, but they have high groundwater table in many parts of the city. So now they require that water to be reused. So their new buildings are, if they hit that nuisance water, they are reusing it for, they can treat it, use it for toilet flushing, they could filter it for irrigation, can be put to some kind of non-potable use. Um, and just another example, there are uh, buildings that are now being built to try to be net positive. So they're trying to either create enough more energy than they use or more water, harvest more water on site than they use from rainwater, from gray water, from black water. And this is an example of a building that's connect, connect, collecting the foundation drainage, the steam condensate, the rainwater. Altogether, they're treating it for toilet flushing, for irrigation, and, and for street cleaning. So they've created a supply of water that they can use in the city. And they're saving 15 million gallons a year. So I'll end there. I know there's probably some questions. I can't see them yet, but Candace is going to tell me. I just want to show you our website. Um, my email is up there. The website link is up there. And on our website, we have a forum. It's a technical forum. So if you have questions, you can post them there. On these different drop downs, if you go to gray water reuse under resources, we have a whole series of webinars that we recorded in the past that you can watch. And we have manuals, you can see the, the Spanish and the Chinese pages there. So we have resources. We're trying to be as accessible as possible to as many people. Um, and yeah, so you can go to our website and check it out. And thank you for having me. We can do questions. Um, there were a couple comments about the latest update to Utah's uh, gray water code. Um, that was updated in October of 2019. So I put a link to that along with a whole lot of other things in the chat box for you guys. Thanks, guys. <laughs>